Welcome everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm that familiar bald head that keeps popping up on LinkedIn every now and then. Uh, my name is Matthew Chaco. Um, I am a founding partner at a firm called Spice Road Legal, and I focus to a large extent on technology, data, and financial services. Uh, I've got with, and for the sake of efficiency, I'm going to introduce the other two speakers. Uh, I've got along with me Adya Misra, who's a counsel in our data protection and privacy practice and Ankita Hariramani, who is a counsel in our financial services regulatory practice. Uh, we're going to today take you through how this new law, the Digital Personal Data Protection Act, is going to change life for players in the financial services space. <clears throat> and we're going to tailor it to the audience. So I've looked through the the audience, it looks like we've got about seven to eight banks, we've got about four to five NBFCs, uh, about eight or nine payment players, and the rest are primarily seem to be uh, digital lenders, fintechs in that space. So we're going to kind of tailor this presentation to all of you. We're also going to assume that you've seen our initial introductory presentation to the act <clears throat> because otherwise what will happen is we'll keep repeating a lot of the nonsense and we'll waste a lot of time right um we're also going to assume that you that all of you are fully compliant with your sectoral regulations be it the rbi's regulations the irda's regulations the pfrda's regulations um the SEBI's regulations, or even, you know, Samati's participation guidelines. We're going to presume you comply with all of those. And we're going to tell you how, after a small introduction to the law, we're going to tell you how your life, your compliance architecture, your product structuring will change, and your contractual matrix will change. And we'll take two, three examples of players in the market, let's say digital lending, Mahesh is here, so we'll take up account aggregation, uh, we'll start talking a little bit about financial service conglomeration and cross selling, and we'll tell you how those change. And so the aim is, with those examples, you'll be able to apply to your similar situation. And if you can't, you reach out to us and then we'll tell you the rest. <clears throat> That's the broad aim of the presentation, if we can move on. Okay, so we've done this before, but I'm going to quickly run through this. Remember, this applies only to automated digital personal data. Paper forms, it does not apply to. Paper forms, if converted into digital form, will apply to both the original paper form as well as the digital form. It applies primarily to activities in India dealing with Indian or, or matters dealing with Indian data principles. In certain instances, certain of these obligations may apply to you even if you're not dealing with Indian personal data. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are an American company, if you are a Brazilian company, if you are a Singaporean company, if you're dealing with and offering services in India, you're going to have to deal with this law. There are some exemptions, public interest, litigations, facilitation of M&A, um, prevention of money laundering, all of those issues. Let's leave that aside. Those are final stage evolutionary issues. We're like talking about brass tacks at this point. And the one thing you should notice is that the law is, as it stands, consent heavy. Everything depends on consent. Uh, and the standard of consent is very high. There are a set of available grounds of processing called legitimate cases. They're fairly useless in my view, but we'll take you through that as it goes. Next slide, please. Good news, simplifies localization. So if you've got cheaper servers located in Botswana, please go ahead and use it. There are no problems except for certain critical sectors. Insurance, be careful. <clears throat> um, can you, the only other countries that you should not transfer it to are countries who are on a negative list published by the government. Let us for now assume that they are well-known enemies of the state in India, right? Uh, or neighborhood countries. Those are the two exemptions that I can think of. <clears throat> Remember also that in addition to the DPDA, DPA, SEBI's requirements apply, IRDA's requirements apply, RBI's requirements apply, 
um, PFRDS requirements apply and when Mahesh comes up with his own requirements, then Samati's requirements will also apply. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding on Samati, but, but on the four principal regulators, there is no argument to be made that the DPDPA supplants them. They don't. It complements them. Where the DPDPA imposes higher standards, the DPDPA will be applicable. But for all other purposes, the other regulations will continue to apply. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The simplest thing. So this is the simplest thing that you can look at. Um, till now, most of the of our clients, at least, uh, other than the banks and maybe the securities brokerages, do not have a efficient breach response mechanism in place. Right. Once there is a breach, they call up one of us and start running around uh, like headless chicken, trying to figure out what to do. Technically, that is the worst approach that you can take. We'd suggest you have a cyber crisis management plan or an incident response plan that tells you exactly, creates a sub core committee that then creates a panel of lawyers if you're a global company <coughs> or Indian lawyers if you're an Indian company, uh, insurance communication networks, all of that well identified in prior advance also have internal policies that allow for formats, for reporting, what kind of data collection you'll do, that entire process. Um, you know, the, the other thing you should do is vulnerability and penetration testing on a regular basis. So get all of that done already. If you are in the lending business or if you're a bank or a securities brokerage or an insurance company, it's already mandated. If it's not mandated to you, start doing it now because the law is going to become applicable law very, very soon. The one thing that the law does not do is what is called a harm-based approach to breach notification, <clears throat> which is basically, okay, someone's breached your servers. You want to take a look at what harm can that person do and if, you know, create a paper trail for that. And if there is significant harm, you will report it to the regulators. If there is no harm, you won't report it. That is the approach that say, for example, the EU GDPR takes, that is a relevant part of the approach that the PDPA in Singapore takes, Australian law takes. Unfortunately, Indian laws, as always, takes a hammer approach to the problem. We've got to report all breaches, regardless of whether there is harm or not. Just remember, there is a very, very high fine for not reporting it. So not like the earlier rules, good time for you all to start getting this done. But this is the simplest thing. If you are, remember, this is different from the RBI's and SEBI's reporting requirement. This is a reporting requirement to the Data Protection Board. It may, in my view, replace the reporting requirement to certain, but at this point, it does not. So there is a small chance that you will end up reporting breaches to both certain and the DPB. Regardless, moral of the slide, get your act together on reporting. Next and slide. I guess maybe to add on to that, the number one challenge we see with financial sector regulated entities is the fact that you're often dealing with multiple regulators. An online stock brokerage, for example, could potentially be um, you know, regulated by the SEBI, by PFRDAI, by RD, um, uh, IRDAI, and if you are a public listed company, you have reporting obligations to stock exchanges as well. So your IRPs, your internal SOPs, your uh, systems, your external consultants, everybody needs to be on board to the fact that within six to 24 hours, in most cases, you've got to manage multiple financial sector regulators together with certain now the Data Protection Board of India, and before you know it, affected individuals as well. So just from an incident response plan, um, like Matthew said, very important to get these processes together, or at least start thinking about it if they're not in place. Absolutely. Adya, since you've given me the taste of being silent, why don't you take the next slides as well? <clears throat> um, you know, we will jump into specific use cases, but I think regardless of the type of financial institution you are, regardless of the type of financial sector regulator whose uh, jurisdiction you are subject to, there are a couple of things that we are seeing consistently across the board. 
when it comes specifically to user interactions and user journeys. And probably the most challenging aspect of this is consent. There's a lot that's been said about consent, but where we think it's interesting when you look at it from a financial sector regulatory perspective is that right now, regulators do prescribe consent thresholds. Just by way of example, you've got the digital lending guidelines that require you know, explicit consent to be taken. Um, you've got mutual fund transaction data when that is being collected, you require specific types of consent being taken. So what you see is across the regulators, different standards of consent, they use the term explicit, they use the term specific. And the question therefore becomes, how does this marry with the data protection, um, the new data protection requirements? What standard of consent should we rely on? And at this stage, our advice probably would be is that because these work, because these different regulations work together, you should probably perhaps pick the law that prescribes the highest standard of consent that applies to you. So if, for instance, the data protection uh, requirements under the new law require consent to be free, informed, specific, unbundled, and if you got the RBI digital lending guidelines that just use the term explicit consent without describing what they mean might be worth relying on the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill standard of consent because that gives you very, very clear instructions and is fairly comprehensive in terms of the permissions you are taking from users. The second aspect is also a good idea to start re-looking really at your privacy notices and really looking at the kind of transparency and accountability notices that you are making available to individuals. Right now, we are aware we've also on some level, all lawyers have been guilty of 20 page terms and conditions, 10 page privacy notices. Those standards change. So your privacy notices also need to be revisited. Um, not because the law prescribes specific privacy notices, but if you look at the standards of consent, it has to be informed, it has to be specific. So the kind of notices you provide to consumers has to become a lot more granular than say what the standards in the market are today. So just from a process perspective, getting your privacy notices in order number one, and number two, and a lot has been said about it, but also making sure you have translators on board that is something companies can do preemptively because of the 23 language notification requirement. That okay, is- Let me just jump in. <clears throat> um, these consent journeys that are required apply in respect of data that is collected now once the law is in place and after. There is a small loophole before that, that pre-existing data can be used without the high requirements of consent, high threshold requirements of consent, but with a provision of a privacy notice, as long as consent under the SPDI has been taken. Um, I don't want to go be more explicit because obviously this is a sensitive issue, but there are ways in which companies can organize their consent architecture at this point to reduce the transaction cost and user drop-off that will be incident on a very involved, detailed, unbundled consent procedure. Um, happy to discuss this in detail over another call, but at this point, perhaps leave it to say that the higher thresholds apply only for the future. There are loopholes within the law that could allow you to structure systems to take slightly less higher standards of threshold. Go on, Adil. Thanks for that, <laughs> Matthew. So, yeah, interesting to note there are a lot of practical loopholes in general. You will see that across the board when you're looking at the law very closely. But that's on consent, right? So just looking at your user journeys, looking at your consumer interactions, uh, looking at the kind of notices you're making available. I do want to point out, and Matthew touched upon this at the beginning, is that while this law applies to digital personal data, if there is personal data that is being collected offline, that is being digitized at a later point in time, so if you are manually, for instance, collecting data, 
it's important to account for those user interactions as well. Um, and how that works um, in the physical world is going to be very, very different. So do you need additional forms? Do you need infographics? Do you need people who are collecting that data to be able to be well-trained and to be aware of the data sets that are being collected and be able to explain to consumers what they are uh, giving up when they are providing data? So just your don't ignore the offline um, the offline data collection processes as well. Now, the third thing that is also very useful is that obviously this is going to require large level changes to your UI, to your systems architecture. Because the way consent works right now is that I might be buying, for instance, um, or I might be opening a bank account. I might also decide not to provide consent to receiving marketing and promotional activities. And I also might withhold my consent for a bank to be able to use my data to improve upon their services. Matthew, on the other hand, might agree to all three. The bank needs to be in a position where there are two individuals who... Still if you... works, but okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but effectively in this hypothetical world, you would, a bank would need to be in a position, have the systems and architecture in place that allow individuals with two differing consent thresholds, consent preferences to access the servers in a way that is equal, where you don't favor one consumer because they are perhaps agreeing to receive promotional and marketing materials or their data is being used to improve the services. So um, that requires, of course, a lot of back-end infrastructure changes as well. So uh, all in all, consent, and this is, again, like I said, regardless of the type of financial sector regulated entity you are, because these principles effectively remain the same. Um, could we hit the next slide, please? On outsourcing and downstream obligations, and Matthew, feel free to jump in uh, as well on this, is, and before we get started, I think one important concept to set out, right, for this um, entire next 45 minutes is that the law regulates data fiduciaries, where a data fiduciary is an entity that determines the purposes and means of processing personal data. Now, who a data fiduciary is, is contextual, depends on the type of processing activities they are undertaking. You also have data processors. The crudest way to think of them is a service provider or a vendor that processes or touches the personal data for limited purposes on behalf of the data fiduciary. Data processors are not subject to any statutory obligations under the new law. So the entire onus and burden of compliance and liability falls on data fiduciaries. And of course, significant data fiduciaries, which are a subcategory of data fiduciaries that the government will prescribe. While we don't really have visibility on who significant data fiduciaries will be, I think we can all be rest assured that it's likely that banks, larger NBFCs, and probably some of the fintechs that are doing interesting things with data are likely to be classified as significant data fiduciaries. Now, what this means is that while every regulator right now, and let's use the RBI's outsourcing guidelines or the SEBI's new cybersecurity framework, right? If you look at all of these different guidelines and frameworks, they all require certain outsourcing agreements to be in place when you are engaging vendors. What they do require is detailed clauses, but the problem with the way the new DPDTA is structured is that these contracts, complex enough as they are right now, have actually got a little more complex. Because what regulated entities really need to ensure is that they are monitoring risks, they are monitoring liabilities, and they're making sure that there's systems in place to ensure compliance by data processors. You will have to contractually ensure that your data processors comply with your instructions, they are being responsible with your data, the security measures are in place, if there's a data breach that occurs, they inform you. If there is a data principle request that you as a data fiduciary receive, you make sure that the data processors comply with it as well. So for instance, if I'm 
a bank that receives a data erasure request. And for whatever reason, hypothetically, I know it's not as simple as that, but if the bank does agree to erase that data, they have to make sure every single one of their vendors, including, for instance, AWS, that, for instance, if you know data is stored on AWS, that data is deleted from the processor's end as well. So what you see is large level complexity with the data processing agreements. We do notice audit clauses and regulated entities' ability to audit their service providers and vendors. That is something that will actually have to be further fleshed out under the DBDPA. You will need to ensure that you are undertaking regular impact assessments, including in respect of vendors. You have auditors on board who are responsible enough and practical enough and savvy enough to understand the data protection nuances. You will need to probably maintain internal paperwork. And do remember, if your service providers are appointing subprocessors, your subprocessors also need to agree to this kind of visibility. So in every picture, a ladder, you need to ensure at every step of the ladder, there is a subprocessor that is agreeing to these processes. So, out, so generally outsourcing, generally data processing, and generally your vendor relationships have got more complex. The advantage is that because of the nature of the industry, there are base protocols in place. So it's not going to let, require large level rehauling, but it will definitely require some amount of reopening. With that, can we hit the next slide, please? Matthew, do you want to maybe, and I know we spent some time discussing the ways we were, you know, the practical implications of this law. Right. Uh, in terms of case study one? Of course, digital yeah. lending. Sure. So I thought we could take digital lending, split it and kind of evaluate how this law would apply to a typical digital lending situation. Uh, two sets of players in a digital lending <clears throat> scenario. The lender, NBFC bank, whatever they may be, or and the loan service provider, the LSP, uh, the entity that runs the digital lending app. It actually had a strange situation where the LSP was not running the DLA, but let's assume for the purposes of this example that the LSP runs the digital lending app. <clears throat> the first question that comes up is, okay, so for, in, from a train of transaction, Adia comes to the website, to, to the app, signs up to a digital lending app, goes on and says, and, and in that signing up process, provides her name, her email ID, her age, her marital status, her ethnicity, her, you know, everything that might be relevant to the digital lender onboarding process. <clears throat> and then confirms that the digital lending app may use that for five purposes, whatever they may be, including, you know, some element of data analysis on her and all of that. Thereafter, Adya goes on and then says, I want a loan of one lakh, and then clicks on, and then clicks on I want that loan and then goes to a, a little part of the UI which says, and all of these are heavily regulated, UI which says, hey, do you want a loan from XYZ Finance Limited or XYZ Non-Finance Limited or ABC Finance Limited, you know, about, about 10 lenders that are available on the app. You go click on one and say, this is my preferred person because these are the better rates that I get, yada, yada, whatever. And then it goes to the lender the lender runs some analysis, maybe with the help of the LSP, maybe not, but runs some analysis in the entire process and says, TK, Adya can have a one lakh ka loan. Now, the first question that we have is from a data perspective, is the lender a fiduciary or a data process? It is fairly obvious that for all practical purposes, all lenders will be a data fiduciary, right? No matter what anyone tries to tell you, chances are many of those lenders will also be 
a significant data fiduciary. If you're a very small NBFC, maybe not, but most banks and many of the larger NBFCs will be what's called a significant data fiduciary. So my first advice to all lenders, and I think they've gone to everybody, every all of the banks we work with, and all most of the NBFCs as well, get yourself a data protection office, right? Start training a team on data protection issues, right? Because 99 out of 100, you're going to be an STF, you're going to be required to do that. Get basic data protection impact assessment protocols ready, right? You don't have to do the assessment, but get the protocols ready, you know, talk to us, talk to other consultants about how this should work, but be ready for that SDF classification. Uh, <clears throat> and then the next question is, okay, so since the digital lender or the digital lending app is collecting data on behalf of the lender, the digital lender should be a processor, right? Because they're just taking the data and giving it to me and I'm processing it. That's what the digital lending guidelines at least seem to suggest regardless of what works practically. Now, that's not true, right? The digital lending app typically does 20 other things in respect of the data. If the digital lending app is primarily a data collection and transfer app, then the digital lender's business would be close to easily re replicable and fairly useless, right? Therefore, 99% of the digital lenders that we have profiled, including most of the ones we work with, will end up being data fiduciaries. All the larger ones will end up being significant data fiduciaries. Now, lenders may be tempted to say that actually, no, in respect of the lending transaction, you are a data processor. You might be a fiduciary in other transactions, but in respect of the collection of my data for my lending, you are a data fiduciary, you are a, you are a data processor. Yes, that is a position that the banks can, or the other lenders can try and impose. That is not necessarily a good position for the lenders. Because what that means is that if they are a data processor under Indian law, the data fiduciary, i.e. the bank or the lender, will be 100% liable for all the actions of the data processor, which you don't want. No matter what indemnity you take, you do not want to be a large bank in the country getting an indemnity from a small fintech. Right? So, there's a little bit of a tussle. Right? Similarly, as a DL, as a digital lender slash loan service provider, if you are a data fiduciary, you will have to have to accept data subject rights, liabilities to consumers, 100 other things that you'll have to do. You might even be, if you deal with lakhs and lakhs of data, you might be a significant data fiduciary imposing compliance burdens on you. Therefore, you may not want to be a data fiduciary. You might actually want to be a data processor. <clears throat> so what I mean to say by this discussion is the mix is up in the air. What you are in the digital lending framework depends materially on the role you provide with respect to each data set. You will all definitely be a data fiduciary with respect to employee data. There's no way out of that one. However, with respect to digital lending transactional data or customer data, the question of whether you are a fiduciary or a processor depends upon your agreement with the, the between the parties and on what you are doing with the data. Therefore, there are strategic calls to be made in this question. Do I want to be a fiduciary? Are the costs of being a fiduciary justified by the benefits of being a fiduciary? Am I better off being a processor? Am I better off being a processor with some lenders and a fiduciary with other lenders? So all I have to say is within the digital lending ecosystem, a world of opportunity has opened up. No longer can the lenders say this data is mine. If you accept that you are, if you are a data fiduciary and you structure your contract in that manner, 
the lenders cannot force you to do a hundred things that they are doing right now. However, should you be that fiduciary liability risks come to you, cybersecurity insurance risks need to be dealt with, consent needs to be taken in a hundred explicit manner, which given the RBI DL guidelines, you probably already have to. But unlike the RBI DL guidelines, consent will have to now be unbundled, be unambiguous and specific. Remember, the RBI guidelines only use the word explicit. <clears throat> now, in my personal view, explicit means it has to be unbundled, unambiguous and specific. Unfortunately, 100% of the DL industry does not agree with me. But now, wake up. It has to be unbundled. It has to be unambiguous. It has to be specific. It has to be in 22 languages. You need to have DPOs, okay, maybe not DPOs, grievance officers. You need to have data subject access rights, correction rights, specific deletion rights. So the world just, the, the world of data liability, responsibility and governance just opened up in the world of digital lending and it's going to change everything. So my first preliminary advice is grapple with the change understand what it means and figure out strategically what you want it to be right remember also that the analysis has to be data set by data set not oh i'm a data fiduciary therefore i have to do everything you might be a data fiduciary in respect of x you might be a data processor in respect of y you might be sharing data fiduciary responsibilities with another party in respect of something think that through if you are a fiduciary, there are a hundred compliance burdens, hundred compliance burdens. There are 50 ways in which your contractual matrix will have to change. You will have to impose liabilities, indemnities, coordination mechanisms, breach response, notification mechanisms all throughout. You may be liable for breaches at the end of your processes. So you've got to think through all of these and figure out your prosec policies, your contract will look very different. The simple NBFC partnership agreements that we saw, or what a good thing in the industry is a tripartite agreement, which I've been trying to tell them for the last three years means nothing. But all of those need to change and need to be improved with significant data-related clauses, significant liability-related clauses. And one of the things that I expect that you will see, which we've already I have clients ask is, there's a potential 250 crore liability. And the other side is saying that they can limit liability only to 250 crores. Is that okay? I'm not going to give you the answer to that. But that's one of those questions that you'll have to grapple with. How are we going to deal with this huge level liability that this act imposes? At this point, can we stop and see if there are any questions? I'll just look. Yeah, there's one interesting question from Anjali. Wait, go ahead, Matthew. Go on. So the question is, what if a data processor uses the data received from a fiduciary during processing for issuing research reports or data reports on a collective basis? which don't contain any individual data, whether they'll become a data fiduciary in this regard. So to quickly rephrase that question in two ways. If a data processor uses metadata to prepare research reports, are they a, do they become a fiduciary by virtue of their use of metadata? Second question, if they use individual personally identified data, but then use it in a collective manner. And I don't know what collective manner means, but I'm guessing it means de-identified, pseudonymized manner. Do they then become a data fiduciary? The answer is if you use metadata and only metadata and it's structured in a very careful manner, and there is nothing else that indicates that you are a fiduciary, you could probably end up becoming a processor, which is why I said, let's think through this strategically. You've got to think through it. It is highly unlikely from a practical perspective that you can make it work, but theoretically you could be a processor. 
if you use pi data turn it into meta make it you know disappear come back to life then you are processing personal information and you are therefore a fiduciary i hope that helps just to add on the process of de identification or anonymization is processing so even if you are trying to anonymize the data the fact that you are doing it brings you within the ambit of the law correct so the way it has to be structured would have to be that the fiduciary de identifies it and passes it on to you and you thereafter have only access to anonymized data it's not going to be easy fiduciaries are not going to willy nilly do it uh, but yes i can see adi and i arguing on both sides of this debate you know in the next few years uh the next question is whether if data is encrypted or anonymized after consent is taken and collected do i have to worry about my cyber security framework and compliance if you are a player in the regulated industry regardless of whether data is anonymized or not you will have to worry about your cyber security framework and compliance and report neither the rbi nor certain uh, nor irdai nor sebi i'm not very sure about pfrda of ankita do you know whether pfrda requires reporting within a fixed time uh, yes yes matthew so even the pfrda so all I mean, of the regulators have reporting requirements that are divorced from anonymity and pseudonymity therefore you'll have to worry about it you may get away with not having to report it to the data protection board and if you are a global company if you are a global company you will then be able to you will probably be able to also get away from breach reporting obligations in europe and singapore perhaps right uh are there anything to add here So, yeah, that's line. Shweta Janki Raman has one more interesting question, which is the question of contrary to any agreement, what do we do with indemnity clauses? Are they still enforceable? The Data Protection Act does not make your indemnity clauses not enforce, uh, enforceable. What it means is that you will have to pay out of your pocket, and as any good actual, you know, if you look at the history of indemnity, that's how it ought to work before the venture capitalist came and twisted it out of any context. um what we will have to do is you'll have to pay first and then collect from the indemnifier i hope that helps okay more questions do you see whether indian res will be required to enter into separate dpas in addition to the msas oh 100% amartya there is no way out of that if you try and skip that obligation you will be in trouble in fact you should also go back to your existing msas and slas and start sensitizing your partners that a dpa is coming and also factor in intense negotiations on the dpa including on base questions like who's a processor who's a fiduciary right and you should not go with a one size fit fits all approach you should evaluate strategically each of those relationships and figure out how you want to play this uh one more in case data is received by banks or nbfcs as part of debt servicing agreements and or dpas would the financial services entity be considered as a data processor highly unlikely we work with a whole bunch of seven or eight banks none of them treat themselves as data processors <clears throat> even in respect of loan data right or debt servicing data uh there is a relevant question that can be raised in respect of asset reconstruction companies but since you didn't ask me that question i'm not going to answer that okay um i think we spent a good enough time on digital lending and mahesh is still here so i think we should talk about account aggregators okay i'm presuming everyone knows what an account aggregator is um but very simply both the fius and the fips are data fiduciaries by maybe on account of samathi's brilliant work maybe not account aggregators are not classified as data fiduciaries which is good they're just a pipe they should be a processor they should have no other liability <clears throat> but then again now comes the question of in that agreement between fius and fips and aas are the account aggregators now going to have to indemnify the fius and fips for data breaches or cybersecurity 
breaches that are on account of their actions. If I was representing the FIUs and FIPs, I would rather strenuously act, much to Mahesh's uh, anger probably, I would strenuously argue that the account aggregators now need to take cybersecurity insurance and need to indemnify me up to 250 crores for any loss I suffer for their <clears throat> for for problems at their end. Whether that works or not, practically is a negotiating tactic, but I can see this coming up. Uh, there is also that brilliant new invention within the ecosystem, which is a technical service provider. They will probably be a data processor, which means you should load up your contracts with TSPs to get indemnities. And you should also make sure that before you tie up with a startup who has five crores of net worth, you evaluate whether it makes sense for an organization of your size to take a risk of a potential fine of 250 crores for the benefits that the TSP is, is giving. So what I see happening within the account aggregator system is that the mushrooming small TSP ecosystem might slowly get eaten up by larger well-funded TSPs who can then afford the cybersecurity and data protection protections that this act requires you to do. Right. Um, is Sahamati a consent manager is a question that I keep getting asked. I'm not going to answer that because the act is unclear. Sahamati is a creature of the RBI statute. Will they now also be supervised as a consent manager by the DPB? I would hope not because the RBI has proved themselves to be fairly competent regulators of this open data, open banking ecosystem. So given they've done such fabulous work, I think we should work with the RBI, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see how that plays out. And that is a personal opinion. Well-informed experts may disagree. Uh, the third thing is on the consent artifact, the much wanted consent artifact. Again, because of purpose limitation within the act and because of um, necessity being dictated within the act, the manner in which you use consent artifacts now changes. You can't go under that 103, 104 general purpose kind of, you know, PFM kind of approval, unless you actually have got consent for that. So there are two questions that come up in light of consent artifact. One is, will we need an additional consent architecture for FIUs to take consent of the individuals in addition to the consent artifact? Technically, under the law, it looks like you would. Alternatively, the consent artifact might have to change to take the more involved, layered, multi-language consent that the new law requires to happen. So either one of two, but regardless, that consent artifact, which is a very simple artifact at this point, will now change to a far more complicated artifact. Next slide, please. Are there anything to add? I also think it's going to be very interesting to see how account aggregators as consent managers, um, taking a step back, consent managers under the DPDPA, if you read the law very closely, are almost agents of data principles. Um, while they are not data fiduciaries, there is a certain fiduciary responsibility that is owed to data principles. So what's going to be very interesting to see is how the existing account aggregator companies that act as pipes are also going to bring in and balance the kind of duty of care almost that they owe to uh, data principles because they are exercising consent on their behalf almost. So that will practically be very interesting to see. Um, I know a lot is going to be set out in the rules, so worth watching out for that and seeing how that will kind of coincide with the account aggregators. Perfect. I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to quickly touch upon the other thing that we keep getting asked by large entities, which is how can I cross sell multiple financial products? I am a bank. I've got an insurance arm. I want to use my data from the banking arm to the insurance arm. Uh, I have a an insurance company, I want to use it for uh, my stock brokerage company. Is that possible? And the answer till now has been sectorally dependent. For example, where 
you have you're an insurance company that wants to use insurance data to cross sell uh, the standard transfer of of data protocols are not worked so what we advise on is creating a black box within the insurance company trigger out cross selling from within the insurance company but as regards SEBI rules, RBI rules, and PFRDA rules, there's a little bit more flexibility. However, now for everything, in addition to what the regulators ask for, we'll have to go back to consent. We'll have to take layered consent for, okay, maybe not layered, unbundled consent for cross-selling financial products. Not possible for AMFI data, again, just putting it out there, but for other forms of data, if you are trying to cross sell, you will have to go and take specific permission from them saying, you've given me data for the purposes of buying insurance. I'm going to give it to my affiliate who's going to sell you one, two, three, four products. Please confirm whether I can do that for one, two, three, four products. I may say, I don't want you to do that for a stock brokerage but I may want you to do that for the rest of it. And your system will have to be evolved enough <clears throat> to take that into consideration, right? So the first part of that is consent, consent as a form of cross sell, consent as a form of enabling cross selling becomes very complicated. The second thing that then happens is I can ask you to cross sell some and not cross sell others. So this, you know, yes or no approach that most financial services entities use right now does not work. Now there is yes for one, no for the other, yes for one, no for the other kind of approach that your database will have to take. The third is, even if you take consent for that, you'll have to take consent in my view for a limited time period. You can't say I'm going to cross sell my financial products for you for the rest of time. Right. And you'll have to specify the time by which you will ask for it. And if someone does not respond to it, you cannot assume consent. There has to be an affirmative consent given to you. So all of these come to you in addition to your sectoral regulators. So remember, your sectoral regulators do not use that right now. So both from an insurance reseller perspective, a stock exchange lead generator perspective, a digital lender perspective, the entire cross-selling architecture will have to change. Many of the things that your business ends want to do, you know, for example, <clears throat> I have a bank, an insurance company, and a PFRDA player, and I want to create one non-segregated data leak, right? To quote a very old 90s cartoon, keep wanting, not happening, right? Just not happening. There are complicated data lake solutions that you'll have to create, segregated, non-mingled, yada, yada, that entire architecture. So that entire process will have to be streamlined. I want to have one shared services entity within the group who will now provide all these, you know, cross-selling services. Very difficult to make work might work in respect of one or two products, will not work in others, might have to work in tandem, might have to be an outsourced service provider to some lines of business. So complicated. Intra-group data transfer arrangements have become complicated. There is also a fair chance that within <clears throat> bank, insurance company, whatever other regulated entity you have, many of them are processors and fiduciaries to each other. So your entire process will have to take into consideration all of these, right? And that changes the landscape. So please do not forget cross-sell. The entire sale in the financial services space will have to be re-architected to be data subject friendly. Oh, sorry, data principle friendly. But, but yes, it'll have to change. Any questions around this? Nope. So that's good. Are there, do you want to pick up now? I've spoken for way too long. So, so oh, there is a question. Okay. There is a question. This can be managed by consent managers ideally. They can give consent. So, Shweta, I think there is a major misconception on what a consent manager is. A consent manager is something like, a, in my head, something like a Sahamati, who is a representative of the data subjects. 
they can give you consent for something on the basis of consent received from the data principle, but they can't take bundle consent. They're not a short form for, you know, a, a shortcut towards bundle consent or ease of operation. The law will not allow it. If the law even dreams of allowing it, it is violative of Puttaswami, it's violative of 141921. It will be non-maintainable. So that that dream that a lot of my clients have that this will be, the consent manager will be the solution for all their problems, not going to happen, right? The consent manager will provide you solutions for short targeted issues. Um, that too, we'll have to see how it works. Uh, I can, I can tell you, I've been working with Mahesh and his fabulous team at Samati for years. And I can tell you how difficult it is to even structure that and to build consensus that this is how it should work. So please do not assume that that consent manager will work. There is another concept of a fund consent manager, which is, for example, what Privado or One Trust sell globally, right? That is a software that will allow you to manage consent. Can they be used to collect consent and manage it? Yes. But that is just a tech solution to streamline processes once you set up the processes. You still will have to set up the processes and that's going to be a painful process. I hope that answers your question, Shweta. Yep. Um, Adya, do you want to go on? Yep. If you can take the next slide, maybe. And um, okay, um, I'm cognizant of the fact that we have about five minutes. So obviously what we did was pick what we thought were interesting case studies of regulated entities in the market today and how the law impacts them. Uh, this, this is just a snapshot, right? You'd have to evaluate every single product, every single solution, every single business operation by itself to determine how the law applies and what are the different sectoral obligations that apply. But in the interim, what can you do? What should you, as I'm presuming, in-house legal, in-house risk, in-house compliance, or in-house IT even be thinking about? So broadly, I think we categorize them into four buckets. The first one is, and we spent some time on it, is actually determining what kind of actor you will be under the law. That actor characterization, whether you're a data fiduciary or a data processor, is not a one-size-fits-all. That's number one. Number two is it can't apply to all your processing activities. So again, you would have to go solution by solution, service by service, processing activity by processing activity to determine what the business purposes are, how you undertake the business, and therefore the type of entity you could potentially be characterized as. Um, you know, characterization as a data fiduciary or a data processor, a big part of it arises from contracts as well and the kind of roles and responsibilities you pay. But also, the fact is that you must evaluate what your actual business purposes are to determine whether you are a fiduciary or a processor. So the actor analysis is complex because it will require you to study each processing activity. You cannot take a general um, approach to characterization. So just by way of example, simplistic, but you could be a data processor as a TSP in the account aggregator framework, but you would definitely be a data fiduciary in respect of your employees' data or you would be a data fiduciary in respect of the business contact information of your partners. So again, each bucket needs to be identified very, very clearly. The second point is contracts. Now, um, we've touched upon this, but when we think of the fact that there's going to be such a large scale reopening of contracts, again, I'd divide them into three or four phases. Number one is actually do an analysis of all the contracts you have right now. Classify them based on risk levels, based on, based on the type of sensitivity of the data that is being managed. Also start preparing data protection annexures you know, or data processing agreements. Uh, sound off your vendors and partners that these contracts are coming. Create audit mechanisms, audit trails, monitoring systems to ensure compliance. As a data processor, you can be well assured that these 
contracts are going to come. So you could preempt the requirements and start putting together the processes in, um, in place as well, just so that you've got a bit of a head start before the contracts come to you and require you to rehaul processes. In terms of policies and processes, like we said, there are multiple regulators you are dealing with. So looking at the highest consent standards, looking at your incidence response plans very, very carefully to account for the fact that there are multiple regulators that you will now be dealing with. Looking at your retention and erasure policies very closely because the law has prescribed um, you know, very strict data retention requirements. So you will have to evaluate it with the financial sector regulator that you are subject to and analyze what the appropriate retention period for data will be. Um, in addition, and um, there are not too many localization wars you need to worry about, but where there are concerns, those don't really change because the DPDP is fairly, um, it's fairly non-controversial when it comes to localization. If we could, um, I think that is just a snapshot of where you can begin. So very quickly, actor analysis, look at your internal documentation, look at your policies and contracts, and where necessary, just make sure your localization processes are in place. Um, with, and I'm just going to, we do have two minutes, so I'll just quickly run through this. Your incidence response plans need to factor for multiple sectoral regulators. When it comes to InfoSec policies, uh, one part of it is, of course, your written documentation, but actually making sure you have the processes in place to ensure security. The first place to begin is making sure your data maps are in order. It's called Record of Processing Activities or ROPAs in the EU. In India, you could also call it Know Your Data, but making sure you all are running with those processes. Identifying the data subject rights that do apply, certain laws might offer more enhanced rights than the DPDPA. Making sure you've got data rate policies to be able to safeguard personal data and confidentiality of personal data should a government um, inspection or audit occur. And perhaps most inter importantly, looking at your internal appointments. Now, if you're just looking at the volume of work, this can't be handled by a legal team alone. It can't be handled by a tech team alone or a compliance team alone. There is a need to share knowledge and to work together. So what we thought is very useful is looking at internal privacy teams that contain a combination or representation of lawyers, tech folks and compliance individuals who are well versed with putting these processes together. This, will, this is something that will need to be in order for you to kind of combat what the law is going to bring. With this, I'm going to pause. Um, it's exactly five o'clock, but Shweta does have one more question, which is, will a more stringent sectoral localization restriction override the DPD in terms of cross-border data transfers? Yes, it will. The law is very clear on that. Um, with this, um, I think we'll stop here. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Please feel free to reach out with any questions you do have. Yeah, as always, if you have questions, reach out to us. If you disagree, reach out to us because you see this evolve very, very quickly, quickly in the span of the last three months. And I think we're also expecting, given the feedback from the ministries, that this will evolve even quicker in the next three months. Um, so touch wood and good luck everyone with implementing this. Take care. Bye-bye.